congregations and temporary morgues with the bodies of the deceased. And I'm referring, of course, to our current COVID-19 global pandemic, but the narrative also describes a world event that occurred a little more than a century ago at the height of the First World War, the so-called Spanish influenza. By the time the Spanish flu burned itself out in the spring of 1919, it is estimated that one third of the world's population had been infected. 50 million people were dead, including 675,000 Americans. That's about the same number of Americans as died in the Civil War. Now, for me, the suspicion that history might be repeating itself in 2020 first occurred to me in February of this year when I saw distressing pictures from Wuhan showing patients besieging hospital emergency rooms and clamoring for treatment. Perhaps you too saw images from China of hospital being raised overnight and the vast waiting rooms filled with row after row of cubicles holding suspected coronavirus patients. For me, those pictures recalled haunting images from 1918 of an emergency influenza ward at Camp Funston, a U.S. Army training camp in Kansas. And the image that I recollected, you can see row after row of men laid out on cots following a flu-like illness that swept through the camp in the spring of 1918. I have to be honest with you, it's a good thing I wasn't asked to give this freeze lecture back in February when the first cases of coronavirus infection were being reported in the United States. It would have been a very short little talk. <laughs> uh, back in February, everything I knew about the Spanish flu would have fit nicely on a little post-it note. And I, I'm not talking about the big post-it notes either. I'm a historian whose specialty is uh, the 20th century United States. But for me, the 1918 flu pandemic as well as the pandemics that followed it in 1957 and 1968, those were black holes in my knowledge of US history. The 1918 flu pandemic is rarely mentioned in United States history textbooks. In 30 years of teaching at Augustana, I have never said a word about this pandemic in class. And before this year, I had never read a book or article about it. But all of that changed back in March when Augustana suspended face-to-face -face classes and closed the campus to students for the rest of the term. On the last day that the library was open, I went in there and I checked out every book I could find on the shelves about the great influenza of 1918. One of those books was by the environmental historian Alfred Crosby, was one of the first historians to even write a history of the pandemic back in the 1970s. Crosby marveled at how little the 1918 flu imprinted itself on the nation's collective memory. He said, Americans took little notice of the pandemic when it happened and quickly forgot what they did notice. So that's part of why I never paid much attention to it. Today, I'm happy to share with you what I learned this spring and summer while doing my personal research on this 1918 flu. I will want to talk about how the flu spread, how and who it killed, how the medical establishment and policymakers fought it, and, and what could be learned from this terrible moment in our national history. But to me, one of the most interesting questions is how and why this flu came to be forgotten. Now, like today's coronavirus, no one knows exactly where the 1918 flu virus originated. One theory says it came from China. Another says Northern France. Many agree with historian John Barry, who believes that the 1918 flu originated right here in the United States in Haskell County, Kansas, a sparsely populated corner of that state. Haskell County was a place for fierce storms, beautiful sunsets. Farmers and ranchers there raised cattle, hogs, chicken, migratory birds by the thousands, the hundreds of thousands passed overhead on their way north and south 
creating a perfect mixing bowl of animals from which the virus could jump to humans, mutate, and begin its deadly killing spree. It was in January 1918 that a Haskell County physician, Dr. Loring Miner, sat in his study and pondered the season's influenza, or la grippe, as it was then called. Young men in the county were unexpectedly dying. Perplexed by the unusual symptoms and rapid deaths of otherwise healthy young men, Dr. Miner took the unusual step of warning the national public health officials in Washington, D.C., and that created the first public record of the 1918 influenza pandemic, January 1918. Dr. Miner had cause to worry. The United States had recently joined the Great War, and soldiers were leaving Haskell County to train at Camp Funston near Fort Riley. The Santa Fe Monitor, Haskell County's newspaper, reported in February, most everybody over the county is having the grip or pneumonia. And then it also noted, Dean Nilsen surprised his friends by arriving at home from Camp Funston on a five-day furlough. Dean looks like soldier's life agrees with him. Ernest Elliott left to visit his brother at Funston. Weeks later on February 28th, the newspaper reported, John Bottom left for Funston. We predict John will make an ideal soldier. Not only were the soldiers and their families going back and forth in January and February 1918, so was the highly contagious influenza. On March 4th, the first soldier at Camp Funston reported ill with flu. Within two weeks, 1,100 soldiers required hospitalization, with thousands more sick in the barracks. Then, infected soldiers likely carried influenza from Funston to other army camps, sickening tens of thousands before eventually carrying the virus overseas to war. That's what John Barry says about the origins of the 1918 flu. Those origins continue to be debated, but the one thing we can say for certain is that the flu did not originate in Spain. The Spanish flu came to be called that because Spain was neutral during World War I, and unlike its European neighbors, it didn't impose wartime censorship on the press. In France, England, the United States, newspapers weren't allowed to report on anything that could harm the war effort, including news that a crippling virus was sweeping through the troops. Since Spanish journalists were some of the only ones in the world reporting on a widespread flu outbreak that spring, the pandemic became known as the Spanish flu. The global pandemic lasted for two years. And one of its characteristics was its multiple waves, its three waves, which turned out to be a feature of many flu-like pandemics to come. A significant number of the deaths, as you can see here in this chart, were packed into three especially cruel months in the fall of 1918. When the Spanish flu first appeared though, in early March, it had all the hallmarks of a seasonal flu, albeit a highly contagious and virulent strain. That spring, as troops deployed in mass for the war effort in Europe, they carried the Spanish flu with them. Throughout April and May, the virus spread like wildfire through England, through France, through Spain, and Italy. An estimated three quarters of the French military was infected in the spring of 1918 and as many as half of the British troops on the front lines. Yet the first wave of the virus didn't appear to be particularly deadly with symptoms like high fever and malaise usually lasting about three days. According to limited public health data that we have from the time, the mortality rates were similar to seasonal flu. And then reported cases of Spanish flu dropped off over the summer of 1918 and everyone thought that the flu had simply run its course. What happened next took people by surprise, with a huge surge in both infections and deaths, which started in October and peaked in November 1918. The reasons for this spike are not fully understood, but somewhere in Europe, a mutated strain of the Spanish flu had emerged that had the power 
to kill a perfectly healthy young man or woman within 24 hours of their first showing symptoms. The rapid movement of soldiers around the globe was also a major spreader of the disease. In late August 1918, military ships departed the English port city of Plymouth, carrying troops unknowingly affected with this new, far deadlier strain of Spanish flu. As these ships arrived in cities like Brest in France or Boston in the United States, Freetown in South Africa or West Africa, the second wave of the global pandemic began. From September to November 1918, the death rate from the Spanish flu skyrocketed. In the United States alone, 195,000 Americans died from Spanish flu in the single month of October. And unlike a normal seasonal flu, which mostly claims victims among the very young and the very old, the second wave of Spanish flu exhibited what's called a W curve, higher numbers of deaths among the young and old, but also a huge spike in the middle composed of otherwise healthy 25 to 35 year olds in the prime of their life. Indeed, that age group 25 to 35 suffered more than half of the total number of deaths. That was shocking. Not only was it shocking that healthy young men and women were dying by the millions worldwide, but it was also how they were dying. They were struck with blistering fevers nasal hemorrhages, and acute pneumonia. The patients drowned in their own fluid-filled lungs. British military doctors conducting autopsies on soldiers killed by the second wave of the flu, they described the heavy damage to the lungs as akin to the effects of chemical warfare. In the United States, the rapid spread of Spanish flu in the fall of 1918 was at least partially to blame on public health officials whose response to the crisis was slow and inadequate. The United States Public Health Service made no public comment on the virus until September. The Surgeon General refused to impose quarantines on infected ships because he believed the killer malady was just seasonal flu. The public health response to the crisis in the United States was further hampered by a severe nursing shortage as thousands of nurses had been deployed to military camps and the front lines. That shortage was worsened by the American Red Cross's refusal to use trained African-American nurses until the worst of the pandemic had already passed. But one of the chief reasons that the Spanish flu claimed so many lives in 1918 was that scientists and medical professionals simply didn't have the knowledge or the tools to deal with the virus effectively. With no understanding of viruses, people spoke about flu as if it were a fiend or a poison without understanding exactly what it was. Remember that this was a time when there were no antibiotics. Bloodletting was still a recommended practice and your doctor was likely to arrive on horseback. In 1918, most scientists were convinced that influenza was a bacterial disease. Few had any conception that it might be a virus. This was because in 1918, the electron microscope was yet to be invented and viruses were too small to be seen through the lenses of optical microscopes. Uh, the result was that when bacteriologists took throat washings from influenza patients and cultured them on laboratory media, they saw them teeming with tiny bacilli nicknamed Pfeiffer's bacillus after the German physician who discovered in 1890 that all of his infected flu patients carried this particular strain of bacteria. When the Spanish flu pandemic hit, scientists were intent on finding a cure for Pfeiffer's bacillus. Millions of dollars were invested in state-of-the-art labs to develop techniques for testing for and treating Haemophilus influenza or Pfeiffer's bacillus. And it was all for nothing. This was a huge distraction for medical science, a terrible waste of time and lives. 
Another misconception that was common in 1918 was that influenza was generally a mild infection that only opposed a threat to the elderly or to those with underlying respiratory complications like bronchitis or tuberculosis. Flu does indeed pose a threat to such groups, but in 1918, just as it had during the previous 1890 Russian influenza pandemic, this flu also attacked younger age groups and robust individuals, such as these policemen that you see here. Unfortunately, by 1890, or sorry, by 1918, there were few physicians still practicing who remembered the depredations of the Russian influenza 20 years before and the common respiratory complications of that disease. Furthermore, only a handful of epidemiologists realized that influenza pandemics come in waves, with the second and third waves usually being more dangerous or mortal than the first wave. Well, the result was just like today. In 1918, the initial outbreaks were not taken sufficiently seriously. Many people dismissed the Spanish influenza as, as a joke. A good example would be the war poet, Wilfred Owen. Here you see a quotation from a letter Owen sent to his mother, Susan Owen, from a British army camp in North Yorkshire in June, 1918, shortly before he rejoined his regiment in France. He writes to his mother, Quite one third of the battalion and 30 officers are smitten to with the Spanish flu. The thing is much too common for me to take part in. I've quite decided not to. Imagine the work that falls on unaffected officers. This kind of dismissive attitude only really changed with the second wave of the Spanish flu in September, 1918. This time, the virus not only caused people to fall sick in large numbers, as it had in the spring, it also called fatal pneumonias and a deadly condition known as heliotrope cyanosis. Camp Devons, Massachusetts, near Boston, experienced one of the worst early outbreaks. So many soldiers were sickened there that makeshift beds had to be set up in hallways of the base hospital to take up the overspill. The Surgeon General set four of the nation's leading doctors to investigate. One of them was Dr. Victor Vaughn, who witnessed the death rattles of the worst afflicted officers. He later recalled in a letter, hundreds of stalwart young men and the uniform of their country coming into the wards of the hospital in groups of 10 or more. They're placed on the cots until every bed is full. Yet others crowd in. Their faces soon wear a bluish cast. A distressing cough brings up the blood-stained sputum. In the morning, the dead bodies are stacked about the morgue like cordwood. As the second wave worked its deadly way across the country, mayors and city health officials were left to improvise. Should they close schools? Ban public gatherings? Should they require citizens to wear a gauze face mask? Would shutting down important financial centers in wartime be called for or unpatriotic? Certain U.S. cities fared worse than others, though, and looking back from more than a century later, there's evidence that the earliest and most well-organized responses did slow the spread of the disease, at least temporarily, while the cities that dragged their feet or let down their card paid a heavier price. Here are three examples of how cities responded. By mid-September, the Spanish flu was spreading like wildfire through army and naval installations in Philadelphia. But Wilmer Cruz in Philadelphia's public health director assured the public that the stricken soldiers were only suffering from the old fashioned seasonal flu and that it would be contained before infecting the civilian population. When the first few civilian cases were reported on September 21st, local physicians worried it could be the start of an epidemic. But Cruzen and his medical board said Philadelphians could lower their risk of catching the flu by staying warm, keeping their feet dry and their bowels open. In other words, by giving themselves enemas or taking laxatives. As civilian infection rates climbed day by day, Cruzen refused to cancel the upcoming Liberty Loan Parade scheduled for September 28th. 
And infectious disease experts warned Cruzan that this parade, which they expected to attract several hundred thousand Philadelphians, would be a ready-made inflammable mass for a conflagration. But Cruzan insisted the parade go on since it would raise millions of dollars in war bonds, and he played down the danger of spreading disease. On September 28th, a patriotic procession of soldiers and Boy Scouts, marching bands, and local dignitaries, they stretched two miles through downtown Philadelphia with the sidewalks packed with spectators. 72 hours after the parade, all 31 of Philadelphia's hospitals were full and 2,600 people were dead by the end of the week. Now, the public health response in St. Louis could not have been more different. Even before the first case of Spanish flu had been reported in the city, Health Commissioner Dr. Max Starkloff had local physicians on high alert, and he wrote an editorial in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch about the importance of avoiding crowds. When a flu outbreak at a nearby military barracks spread into the St. Louis civilian population, Starkloff wasted no time. He closed the schools, he shuttered the movie theaters and pool halls, and he banned all public gatherings. Now there was pushback from local businesses, but Starkloff and the mayor held the ground. When infections swelled as expected, thousands of sick residents were treated at home by a network of volunteer nurses. Because of these precautions, St. Louis public officials were able to flatten the curve, as we say now, and keep the flu epidemic from exploding overnight as it did in Philadelphia. According to a 2007 analysis of Spanish flu death records, the peak mortality rate in St. Louis was only one eighth of Philadelphia's death rate at its worst. That's not to say that St. Louis survived the epidemic unharmed. The Midwestern city was hit particularly hard by the third wave of the Spanish flu, which returned in the late winter and spring of 1919. We go now to the West Coast and to San Francisco where health officials put their full faith behind gauze masks. California Governor William Stevens declared it was the patriotic duty of every American citizen to wear a mask, and San Francisco eventually made it the law. Citizens caught in public without a mask or wearing it improperly were arrested. They were charged with disturbing the peace and fined $5. Now, just like today, not everybody wanted to wear a mask. Nearly 2,000 people attended a 1919 meeting of the Anti-Mask League of San Francisco. In his book, historian John Barry says that the gauze masks city officials claim were 99% proof against influenza probably weren't the reason for San Francisco's relatively low infection rates that fall. That probably had more to do with well-organized campaigns to quarantine all naval installations before the flu arrived plus early efforts to close schools, ban social gatherings, and close all places of public amusement. On November 21st, a whistle blast signaled the city that San, Francisco's, San Franciscans could finally take off their masks. And the San Francisco Chronicle described sidewalks and streets strewn with the relics of a tortuous month. But San Francisco's luck ran out when the third wave of the Spanish flu struck in January 1919. Believing that masks were what saved them the first time, businesses and theater owners fought back against public gathering orders. As a result, San Francisco ended up suffering some of the highest death rates from Spanish flu nationwide. That 2007 analysis I mentioned earlier found that if San Francisco had kept all of its anti-flu protections in place through the spring of 1919, it could have reduced deaths by 90%. By December 1918, the deadly second wave of the Spanish flu had finally passed, but the pandemic was far from over. A third wave erupted in Australia in January 1919 and eventually worked its way to Europe and the United States. Even the US president was not spared. In April 1919, Shortly after arriving at the World War I peace negotiations in Paris, Woodrow Wilson became seriously ill with influenza symptoms, high fever, severe coughing, complete prostration, inability to get out of bed, hallucinations. The White House covered up 
the severity of his conditions, claiming that Wilson had merely caught a cold. And it was later claimed, you've probably heard this, that Wilson had a small stroke. But his personal doctor in Paris said that he had the flu. The ailing president abandoned all the principles he had been arguing for, for a just peace and a post-war order, and he went home. And four months later, Wilson suffered a massive stroke from which he never recovered. Again, his personal doctor blamed that stroke on the terrible influenza he contracted in Paris. The mortality rate of the third wave was just as high as the second wave, but the end of the war in November 1918 removed the conditions that allowed the disease to spread far and wide. Global deaths from the third wave were still in the millions, but they they paled in comparison to the apocalyptic losses in the fall of 1918. After the third wave exhausted itself, the flu finally seemed past, but it, it was not past. 1920 saw as many deaths from influenza and pneumonia as 1919. Only in the next few years did it finally fade away in the United States and the world, but it didn't disappear. The Spanish flu continued to attack but with far less virulence as the virus mutated toward its mean and as people's immune systems adjusted. Just a couple of years later, in 1924, the Encyclopedia Britannica Company published a two volume history of the 20th century thus far. More than 80 authors were represented and chapters to these eventful years, the 20th century in the making. There are 1300 pages in this two volume set and not a single page mentions the catastrophic influenza pandemic that killed between 50 and 100 million people worldwide just five years before. Why did the 1918 flu pandemic make so little impact on the collective memory of the world? What we remember seems to depend largely on whether we can make sense of the event in question with narratives that have a clear beginning, a middle, and an end. If there's one cognitive instrument that is ubiquitous and natural to human beings, it's, it's narrative or storytelling. You know, not all human cultures have arithmetic number systems or calculus, but every human culture tells stories. For the countries engaged in World War I, the global conflict provided a clear narrative arc. There's heroes, there's villains, victories, and defeats. But an invisible enemy, such as the 1918 flu, made little narrative sense. It had no clear origin. It killed otherwise healthy people in multiple ways and then slinked away without being understood. So without a narrative schema to anchor it, the pandemic all but vanished from public discourse soon after it ended. Will it be different with COVID-19? Certainly COVID-19 is a much better documented pandemic than the one that occurred 100 years ago. We have 24 seven news coverage now and ubiquitous social media. We have much richer material now about what COVID-19 is doing to the lives of private individuals than we have about the 1918 pandemic. So it's harder to imagine that COVID-19 will be forgotten five years from now, but it could happen. As for lessons we can learn from 1918, I will limit myself to one. And it has to do with what I take to be the biggest challenge facing us today in this nine month of the COVID crisis. I'm thinking of the issue of compliance fatigue with the measures required to lessen the impact of the disease. As we have seen in 1918, many cities imposed restrictions, then lifted them too soon, then had to reimpose them, but people didn't obey the, the laws and regulations. With COVID-19, compliance is going to have to be sustained for months, if not years, and opening and closings repeated. If the public is going to comply over time, they will have to be led, inspired, or compelled. Which brings us to the most important lesson of 1918. 
tell the truth. In 1918, because they were pressured to maintain wartime morale, neither national nor local government officials and news outlets told the truth. The disease was called Spanish flu, which was a lie. And one national public health leader said, this is ordinary influenza by another name. Most local health commissioners followed that lead. Newspapers echoed them. After Philadelphia began digging mass graves, closed schools, saloons, and theaters, and banned public gatherings, one newspaper even wrote, this isn't a public health measure. There's no cause for alarm. But Americans could look around them and see that there was plenty of cause for alarm. So trust in authority disintegrated during the 1918 pandemic. Doctors obviously didn't have a hand on the disease, so people turned away from the physicians and tried out quack cures like aspirin or bloodletting. At its core, society is based on trust. Our human connections move at the speed of trust. Not knowing whom or what to believe, people in 1918 lost trust in one another. They became alienated, isolated, intimacy was destroyed. A survivor recalls, you had no school life, you had no church life, you had nothing. People were afraid to kiss one another. People were afraid to eat with one another. There are cases of people starving to death because no one could deliver food to them. Society began to fray so much that Dr. Victor Vaughn, who I mentioned earlier, wondered in his diary if civilization was about to disappear from the face of the earth. The few places, though, where leadership told the truth had a different experience, and St. Louis was such a place. The community there feared, but they came together. When schools closed, teachers volunteered as ambulance drivers, telephone operators, food deliverers, and emergency nurses. Society can't function when it is every man and woman for themselves. So the final lesson of, from 1918 is that those who occupy positions of authority have to retain the public's trust. And the way you do that is you distort nothing. You put the best face on nothing. You try to manipulate no one. Just tell the truth. Well, that's the end of my talk, and I think we have a little time for some questions. We do, and friends, uh, I put a little note in the chat box. If you are using a smart device, which I think you probably are, you should see a box near the bottom of your screen labeled Q&A. And Dr. Calder has agreed to stick around with us for a little bit, and I can report we have our, our first question already in, and that is this. Are there any indications of lasting changes in culture because of the 1918 pandemic? I, I know that you mentioned that it was surprising how quickly that history book sort of moved on, but are there nonetheless some positive uh, changes that resulted? In culture, I'd be hard pressed to think of a single change because it was forgotten almost immediately. Um, I never once heard my grandparents tell a 1918 flu story. Uh, I wish I could talk to them now. I, I can't because they're gone, but it, it disappeared, not just from the history books, but it seems to have disappeared from people's personal memories too. Now, there are plenty of lasting changes elsewhere and the, the biggest place would be medicine and in public health. There the changes were far reaching and dramatic. Our, our current public health system owes a lot to um, ref the reflectiveness uh, about their failings that followed the 1918 pandemic among American public health officials and the medical establishment. Um, so. Um, before we get to the next question, I will add, I had the opportunity to interview a 1918 graduate of Augustana uh, and well, first off, I should say, Dr. Calder, like you, my grandparents never talked about it, but she did. Uh, this was Esther oh, Andreen uh, Albrecht, the daughter of Gustav Andreen. Mm -hmm. And I had the chance to interview her when she was 103. And uh, her father, who was, of course, the president of the college, uh, 
saw that the best way to preserve her health was he found her a job teaching in rural Minnesota. And she told me, and this would have, the interview was in 2003, about, or 2002, I think, about the many of her friends who died. And uh, she was able to rattle off six names, just like that, of contemporaries of her who died. And, and I thought the equivalent when I was in college at Augustana uh, might have been, or my generation, it wasn't happening then, but was, was AIDS. And I can only think of one close friend and there she was. She had six right off the top of her head. I always found that amazing. But she was the only one I've ever talked to who said that. So our grandparents were alike in that regard. Well, senseless deaths like that are, are not things we want to think about or remember. Um, how many people remember the 57 and 1968 flu pandemics? We remember Woodstock, but it's completely forgotten now that all those young people were partying in the mud and rain at Woodstock while a pandemic was killing a little over 100,000 Americans that year. Um, we do have another question, and I'm going to just tighten it up a little bit and ask, as long as COVID is such a political football, how do you expect trust to improve? So we're asking a historian to bring out that crystal ball. Well, we don't do that because we, <laughs> we only predict the past. <laughs> they leave the future to other people. Given the state of the culture wars in America and our intense polarization today, I don't see any, I don't know how trust can be um, restored. Um, I'm pretty pessimistic about that as a, a historian who's um, studied and followed the culture war since the 60s pretty closely. And um, I've given up predicting that they're gonna end and I think we're gonna be saddled with it for some time. And how we can repair uh, public trust in institutions and in politics in partic particular, um, I do not know. It's gonna take a different kind of leadership and a willingness by, by society to confront the problems presented by things like social media, where it's too easy to um, um, abandon the better angels of our nature and, and give in to the worst. Uh, we have an observation from one of your faculty colleagues, uh, Professor Amanda Bogus, who notes that she does a, a case with her students on U.S. pandemic preparedness and, quote, I have for years, COVID just happens to make it more timely now. One of the topics we discuss is who should carry burden of preparedness? Should government store vaccines, ventilators, equipment, and hope it is still in usable shape if when needed, or should the producers have it ready to go? Should producers be expected to build in surge capacity? Should government subsidize that, et cetera? What are your thoughts? Now, I'll amend that to make it more fair to you as an historian. <laughs> but what has our experience been with preparedness? I mean, we could make a corollary to military. And the, the United States history is fraught with times when we may have been underprepared or overprepared. But where, where historically have those roles fallen, Dr. Calder? Well, we have a national oil reserve because the nation moves forward on petroleum. So why wouldn't we want to have some kind of reserve for um, pandemics, which regularly occur about three times every century? Um, this is the problem with forgetting about 1918, 1957, and 1968. When you forget, then you don't prepare. And uh, surely one of the great lessons that could be learned from this historical story is that we should prepare for the worst while hoping for the best. There is a question that you're welcome to take, but I'm also going to put it out there because next week's speaker is, I think, part of this call. That's Dr. Rebecca Hike, And this might be a question better suited for an epidemiologist, a public health expert like Dr. Hike. The questioner asks, with advances in medicine, uh, sh should this pandemic be less impactful? Uh, and I don't know if you want to take the broad sweep of history or if we'll reserve that for Dr. Hike. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that question since I'm not a, a medical professional. Um, so let's let, let's let Dr. Hike take a crack at that next next time. All right. Um, and another question from a, a faculty colleague, Dr. Varallo. Uh, it's not really so much maybe a question as an observation you're welcome to muse on. Uh, she notes, I wonder if narratives about unexplained death are somehow different than other categories of 
narrative. And, and I would suggest that from a historical point of view, I mentioned a moment ago, AIDS, uh, you know, at the beginning, it was less explained. And then later, we learned much more about it, right? And to see how the public interaction with that narrative changed over time. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that observation from Dr. Varallo. Well, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, if an event is unexplained, what does that mean? That by definition, that means there's no characters. There's no villain. There's, um, his, and a story must have characters. So in the case of a, a virus that's invisible and nonsensical, why it attacks this person who lives and this other person dies, there's no, there's no materials for a story there, a traditional story. Um, now it's the job of historians to create narratives even where other people struggle to do so. And, and so far, the, the way historians have tended to do that is by um, in making heroes out of scientists and telling the story of how science you know, has um, attacked the problem and solved it through vaccines and the like. That's a um, there. That's certainly a story that has um, a lot to recommend it, but it's also an untrue story for 1918, because uh, scientists and doctors and public health authorities, um, you know, bear so much responsibility for the spread of bad information. Then, and some of that was simply the poor state of knowledge at the time and and, and, uh, and some of it was was lying. <laughs> we have a, a question, there's a couple more good ones to so just warn you. <laughs> but this one is about the, the notion of public health information and how it was received in 1918, specifically was compliance or fatigue as you describe it, was that dependent on one's political party or beliefs? I mean, we're no. seeing- no, that's so, a very interesting question. Yeah. Thank you for raising that. And no, it, it was not politicized in 1918 the way it is now. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and, and it would be, I think we got a good political scientist in here for a future lecture. Here's a fascinating one from one of our, 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 our guests whose um, uh, hometown is Gunnison, Colorado, and was wondering, uh, if you had a chance to look at the fact that Gunnison completely closed the town to outsiders for several months over the winter of 1918, her great grandmother was a mortician in Gunnison during that time, and her grandfather occasionally mentioned the pandemic, but she too wishes that he was still here to talk about it. So, did your uh, invite, did your um, research take you through anything with Gunnison? Yeah, Gunnison is probably the best known example of um, communities completely isolating themselves. Uh, in the very early goings and, and reaping the benefits later. Uh, I don't think anybody died in Gunnison at all. Uh, Professor Bogus follows up on the earlier notion about uh, government's role in stockpiling. She notes that the UK invested 15 billion, I don't know if that's dollars, euros, or pounds, in the, uh, it's a lot no matter what, in flu vaccines, which then stayed in storage so long they were functionally useless and had to be destroyed. So now uh, that government and presumably others are hesitant to invest uh, so much in preparedness again. Hmm. Uh, I'm looking through, I think that may take, take us up to date uh, on, the, um, on the questions. As another one comes in though, uh, permit me the privilege of asking you one. Uh, how is it as a professional historian to find those, as you refer to, black holes? I've always been intrigued by that. How you know, something that we think are, we're very fascinated in, others weren't. So what is it like to, to, to explore? To now I'll make the Carl Sagan question. How did you feel in this undiscovered territory? Well, the first feeling I have is embarrassment. <laughs> I'm a 20th century American historian. How do I not know about this? But, uh, the, the, you know, it, my misery has a lot of company. Um, historians, for the most part, or like me, we don't teach it. It's not in our textbooks. I don't know if you can see my office. There's a lot of books in here. I think I could probably say not a single book in here has got a line in it about the 1918 pandemic. Um, so then it's exciting. That's the next feeling to go and explore something that you don't know hardly anything about. Um, 
uh, March, April, May were months when I was reading the books that I had lugged home from the library. That was, was an exciting time. And um, I wondered if somebody might invite me to come give a talk about the 1918 flu and uh, was very happy when, um, when, when you and, and Lisa came, came to me. It made those three months uh, feel like something more than just a, a personal pleasure. Uh. Well, it's a great treat for all of us that you're with us. I think we may have time for another couple of questions. This one, I would love to go at myself as a former journalist, but the questioner asks, would you place higher responsibility on government or the press at the time to tell the truth? I have a journalist's answer, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm not going to sweat that question. Let's just split the difference. They, they, they both they both could have done a better job telling the truth. It's striking to me that Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States, never said a word about the flu in public during his entire administration, that, the, during the whole year. Never said a word about it. Um, and newspaper editors, for the most part, followed his lead. Uh, it was thought to be unpatriotic to, um, to distract attention. Um, from the war effort and depressed morale to talk about death. And, and, and Americans could buy, 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 certainly in the second wave, um, you know, Americans didn't need the president to be telling them there was a flu pandemic. You could see the bodies piling up in the streets. Yeah, I guess I would posit that, uh, I don't know that you have to um, go immediately into judgment, but it helps to begin to under, first understand that they were in a, they were in a crisis, right? With World War One, uh, America didn't know how it was going to go. Uh, Britain and France were, uh, at least France, kind of on their heels uh, as valued uh, allies. And this notion of secrecy, not wanting to give the other side any, uh, you know, unfair advantage. So I, I can understand why governments would uh, treat it the way they did. Uh, but uh, you know, the the the, um, the media, and of course, they b behave differently in 1918 than they do now. They behave differently in 2018 than they do now. I mean, it's constantly changing, but it, it, we like to think in this country that it's the role of the media to not have those parochial concerns and to go at all sides. So off that soapbox. Um, did you, in all of your studies, you, 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 you talked a little bit about this, but Jesse asks, from a historical perspective, was there ever any recognized consensus as to why the virus eventually disappeared? Was it just the, the epidemiological side, as you mentioned? Well, it's, it's a feature of viruses that they're constantly mutating, and they tend over time to mutate towards a, a statistical, uh, what's called a mean, statistical mean, and that, that makes them less deadly over time. Meanwhile, the human population is building up immunities to the, um, those strains of virus, and so um, the virus just eventually burns itself out and goes away. Or, but not entirely. I mean, we still have the Spanish influenza circulating around today. It gives some people what we would think of as cold-like symptoms now. I would note too, as we uh, that um, it happens that this week in our Quad Cities community, local Rotary chapters are reminding people that polio is is not gone. We've made great global strides. There is still one of three wild variants of polio extant on earth, and it may be that today only Pakistan and Afghanistan are affected, but if we don't continue to work at it, it can come back. And that's uh, an important lesson for all of us. Aha, here's the final question, and we'll give you all of about six minutes. <laughs> do you think this virus, uh, do you think this virus that we're in now, uh, you kind of touched on it, do you think it will be remembered a hundred years from now, or will there be some folks like this meeting in a holographic plane to discuss in the 123rd freeze lectures, why didn't they learn from COVID? Yeah, I've been going back and forth on this. Um, part of me wants to say, yeah, I think this one will be remembered because um, this time we have characters to inhabit a narrative. Um, I think there's widespread recognition, at least among the kind of people that I tend to hang out with, that we have a villain in this story, <laughs> in the president of the United States who 
um, has minimized the threat of the virus from the get-go. And so that makes it e easier to start building a narrative about the about COVID-19. And plus uh, another reason why it might be remembered is we just have so much more documentation this time around, especially about its, its impacts on individuals. Um, a problem with normal media reporting on disease outbreaks is it they tend to stop at the hospital door. It, you know, it's hard to go in to the patient's room as a reporter, you, you're usually not allowed in there. So you don't have a lot of photographs of dying flu patients in 1918. Um, not a lot of stories, but with social media, people are telling their own stories. And that, that, that's likely to make the story remembered, at least in some quarters. But on the other hand, I, I could totally see this pandemic being unremembered really a hundred years from now. Um, e even if it led to major public health changes, such as a national stockpile, um, I could still see it fading away because um, uh, this is kind of goes back to Sharon Varela's question. This is a story of, of people dying in awful, gruesome ways. And there's just not a lot of, um, unlike war, there's not a lot of strategy and campaign and heroism. It's hard to make the story noble <laughs> with, with heroes using um, new kinds of tools and weapons to, to, to fight against the enemy. Um, this is just senseless deaths striking people down left and right. And um, most of us human beings don't want to think about that. That's why we like our consumer culture so much because, because it distracts us away from our inevitable mortality. Um, and that makes me wonder if this story too could could be forgotten. We don't want to hear that story. Well, I take great comfort knowing that there are some 30 of our fellow citizens who do. And uh, I want to thank our participants for being with us today. Uh, and as most especially, thanks to Dr. Lendl Calder for sharing with us today and starting this series. And just to whet your appetites, Next Tuesday, we're going to hear from an epidemiologist, a public health expert, Dr. Rebecca Hike, who also has her own uh, story to tell, a personal story regarding COVID. Um, and just to assuage one concern for you, Dr. Calder, the president of the college, dismayed at how little was in the college special collections about 1918, has ordered us to save everything, every <laughs> digital scrap we can, and we will build a special archive such uh, that our, few, our successors will have greater resources than, than we did. But for now, I hope that all of you joining us now would join me virtually in thanking Dr. Lendl Calder for opening our 23rd annual Freeze Lecture Series. Lisa, if you have anything you would like to add, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I would welcome you uh, coming back to join us. Again, I don't wanna put her on the spot. Maybe she's handling a patron question. So I don't wanna put her too much on the spot. Oh, there's Lisa. Lisa, did you have any final words you wanted to add? No, I think this has been a wonderful start and we do look forward to next week and to hearing from Dr. Hike. Um, if you want to go on and register for that, we'll send you ultimate number of reminders. Um, we also have uh, a lot of events still coming up. All of our events are virtual and take home. And so visit our website, look at our calendar. I guarantee there's something there to interest you all. And again, Lisa, thank you for your hospitality. Dr. Calder, thank you for your insight. And friends, thank you for joining us. You make the freeze lectures happen. Thank you all. Thank you.